close, but yeah, it's different to us. Stop, we'll stop with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here. Thank you for the chance to uh, deepen our faith together. We really pray that we can um, hopefully uh, deepen a little bit about what happens when we try and share our faith, how other people learn their faith, and, and share amongst ourselves a little bit about maybe how we can do it best in the best way and we really pray as well too that um, uh, all of the things that we do when we gather together is, is a way to really uh, keep strengthening our community here and find ways to keep reaching out to new ones, new people, people who are um, still looking to hear better about Jesus as well too. We ask Mother Mary to be with us, to guide us, we say how Mary, how Mary, the grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So, I thought we could, I wasn't here last time, but I know that, I, who was here? Um, yeah. Last week, you were, yep. So Father Daniela did a bit of a, one about how to share, like I do a guidelines of, of prayer. Yeah. Did you all have a go at trying to do one? Or? Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, it's <laughs> really hard and it's awfully long time to talk for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how long was it getting you to do it for? About five minutes? Five. Or, yeah, five to two. Most were quite short, wasn't they? Very good. It's really hard, though. Yeah. Well, I thought, from what I... So, yeah, what I, I had a look at his thing, and I think more or less he says the main points is that uh, we need to know what we're trying to do, who's it for, where's it for, what you're doing, how long for, and everything like that. Pray with it yourself. Try and read and imagine what the, the passage is really trying to say. Get into it, focus on some of the characters, especially in Jesus. Then try and think about what touched you the most, what, what you got out of it, what others, how's it apply to me, how's it apply to the audience. And then try to leave the audience with that desire to pray with the pastors themselves at the end. That's what I understood his main points were. And then his last one was like, enjoy it. So even if it was hard or whatever, to, <laughs> to have fun and enjoy it and recognize that it's a chance to share your faith and also to encourage other people to pray. I found that passage that It was all different type, right? mm -hmm. you know, the theme of 5,000, and, and it was good because I was like, oh yeah, that's right, so it's good to get the other perspectives. And that's the truth, like when you when you go to read the Bible and to pray with the Bible, you guys, you were doing a, we were doing a Bible study one, one of those days, like you hear the same words and it, it reaches people in different ways. Yes. And, and what I was thinking to do was follow through a little bit why that happened, a little bit, and to to have a look at about how do we assimilate our faith, how do we learn our faith, how do we try and uh, understand things, look at a bit of the process so that when we, so it might be a little bit theoretical, I don't know, hopefully not too much, but the idea is that it hopefully will make it easier for when we're trying to share something about our faith. Well, I was, I was thinking using my teaching skills behind I was thought, because considering what other people see as just could be different to you, mm -hmm. I would think, wouldn't that be good if I, instead of me telling them, First, wouldn't it be like to someone who maybe has only heard the first time to see what that person thinks of it first, rather than you putting your, your ideas first? I thought, you know, because yes. I've heard so many different. Yep. And even though they may never heard the passage or they don't know the Bible very well, I mean, we do this as little kids, so we say, and it's only usually about three or four, but it's cute to see that they're thinking of it. Even if they're not very good. Yep, exactly right. And look, you'll always get the, a little bit of the problem of, um, it's not a huge problem, but uh, biblical interpretation, you can yeah. get wrong interpretations, That's, yeah. that part's real. Like if, yeah. you, if you open it up to anyone, people can, mm -hmm. as you said, five people can have read the same but then you passage. can say, this, oh, that's interesting, but this is what I, like, you can always throw it exactly. at Exactly, as long as you don't say, this is what, like, like yeah. 100%, this is what it's got to mean for everyone and stuff like that. But, but um, yeah, definitely, I think in that part, this is what we, we sort of want to go into a little bit. Today, a little bit how how it becomes very personalised for different people, and yeah, well, I thought to follow up, like sort of thing. How do people pray with the Bible? And obviously, Father Daniel gave like a way for us to like prepare a, a 
a little preaching about it and to me. Then also, like I think, how do people learn anything about their faith at all, for that matter? Like, like I, I believe that the same, the same sort of more or less the same um, sequence or the same process happens for, for everything that you do about your faith. Of course, it's it's different for different things and everything. And I'm going. I was thinking about to give a little bit something from Bourbon Day, which is like sort of our our so it's out here, like. It's, it's it focused upon the point that with the Word of God, you're not only meant to read it, but you're meant to pray with it. And then a little bit, especially with um, uh, anything with your faith as well too, to get to know it properly, you're going to have to enter into some type of conversation with God so that you can actually get understand it and know it. And that's what prayer is when you really go in. So this is from the Catechism, 2653. It's, a part, it's in the part of prayer and like going into prayer and stuff like that. And I was talking about with the Bible, the church forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. It uses this passage from Philippians 3 or 8, where he's saying we really need to make sure we know about Christ. That the way that we do it is through the Bible. That's, that's one of our deepest um, sources we have. It's not our only source. We believe in traditions bigger than our Christian faith is bigger than only what's in the Bible. Our the tradition that gets passed on to us, all the from the time of Jesus, then also all the way through, all of the, the church fathers and sisters and mothers that have come before us that have teach us about our faith as well too. Let them remember, however, that prayer should accompany the reading of the sacred scripture, so that a dialogue takes place between God and men. For we speak to Him when we pray, and we listen to Him when we read the divine oracles. So it's, it's, it's trying to make it very clear that it's not just simply that we, we read the Bible and then you, you've, got, you've understood God speaking and stuff like that. Sometimes you've got to get into a, a type of conversation to try and understand what that means. And to, to enter into this type of prayer, which is like making the Bible come alive. Because it's a text. But there's, there's words, that, that we say it's the Word of God. But the Word of God is Jesus, the living Word. So behind this text is Christ. When we start to enter into a dialogue with the text and understand the text, but don't say it as a text, like we start coming into a, a moment where it leads us into prayer, then you encounter the person behind the words. Then you get encounter Christ himself. And then it becomes a living dialogue with Christ, not just with the, the text that's written down in there. Because the text itself is, in a sense, frozen in time. So it's, it's dead, in a sense. It's, but it's not a dead, a dead word. If you, if you enter into a way that you pray with it, and that's when Jesus comes alive through the text in that way. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but that's what the Catechism is really trying to say in that moment. And I was praying with this just the other day as well too, from <laughs> came through, from one of, when we were reading this, and I was thinking about how Jesus himself made it very clear that he wants people to not only just listen to his words, but make it part of their life. So it's not just something theoretical, but it becomes intimate and, and part of everything that you live. But this is from Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27. Sometimes called hearers and doers. It depends on what your Bible says, but sometimes the wise and foolish So it says, therefore, anyone want to read it? If you can see it, right? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. So you can see in this, Jesus is, we know Jesus is a living word of God, but he wants us to listen to his word, but not only just listen to it and then carry on with our life. It says, those who hear these words of mine and then put it into practice. That's the point where it's, it's his, his words actually took root in your life and changed your life in some way, shape or form. He's come into it. If, on the other hand, you hear it, but it doesn't really change anything, you don't put it into practice, like you're building on sin, you're waiting, it'll all come falling down sooner or later, because you haven't really brought it into your own life. One thing is to hear it, but the other thing is to bring it inside so that it actually becomes part of what you're trying to live. So 
So he was saying he wants it to take root and to, to be part of what you build your whole life upon. And that's what faith is all about. That you, you allow it to change who you are and what you do. And what you live and what you say and what you speak. Everything that, every part of you starts to get affected by what you understand that you can understand from God. Who you think he is, who you think you are, who you think other people are, and everything that comes with it. So, I was thinking about this just as a bit of a question. Like, if you share your faith with someone, like you have a chance, we've done, some of us have done testimonies now, and or you've done talks about certain topics, and stuff like that, some of us are still working on it. <laughs> Sometimes, even if, if you've got a friend who says, oh, why do you go to church? Like, you might just have a chance just to say to What do you think you, like, what's your goal for sharing, do you think? Well, it's evident that when we, when we, some conditions. We want to, uh, to, to have it accepted by other people, to transmit, to transmit to, to other people. That's the main, main motivation, if you like. But otherwise, I would say that, I was just thinking about that, that means uh, many people, uh, they start to, they have certain beliefs, they have certain one uh, of the new ideas which are coming up in society just now. And they give out immediately, for example, let us say the followers of Trump. They, they accept the ideas of Trump and they, they leave it out. But we, the Christians, we don't give out our Christianity really to the full. Why? If they, there must be a reason for to answer my question. And I think you're right. Like you, want to trans you want to transmit it to them. And then you want to see that it actually they, it becomes coherent with their life. And everything. Yeah, we, I think it might be another question again to go into why do people not live out their faith or in yes. coherent ways, but definitely. But what, what, is, what is the basic principle of Christianity that is who needs to love, love our neighbor? As I, I told you that right of yes. Yeah. And, but we don't see the Christians really living out that love of the neighbor, except indeed for many, for many, I would say. But in general, we tend to, uh, to, well, to live our own life without caring so much about those who don't. Uh, share our well-being or our position in society or things like that. We don't, you know, in many countries. Mm -hmm. no, it's in my country, particularly, I would say that's, that's one of the things which drove me out for some time. I, I, I have to over and over again why I drifted away from, from practice of religion. And for me, not for practice, because I went under the practice, but I became indifferent to God. Uh, I drifted away. Why? Because the church did not live up to what was playing in society at that time, after you know, the 1960s, the 1970s, that is social justice, uh, equality, and so on and so on. They, they kept on to charity, I was just giving a few coins to some people who scarcely surviving or things like that. Not doing harm to our neighbor last week. But it was not something which was instilled into the Christians that we have love, universal love, love of, of all people in the world. Oh, I agree. And I think this is what sometimes we need to. That's when it comes into, yeah, putting it into practice, what we're, we're trying to say. So I think it connects very well with what, what we're trying to talk about here. So for example, when we're looking to share, we, we want to share our faith in a way that, like, to give them in something that transformed their life. We don't want them, well, obviously, everyone's free, right? We don't want to force people to believe or anything like that. But one of our goals, especially if we're really trying to evangelize, is to help them change their life for the better. If we really believe that the Christian faith is the best way to live your life, then 
obviously want to share it to other people so that their life gets better as well too. And so that they don't just hear us talking theoretically, which we can do <laughs> as well too, and everyone does have lots of good theories. I love philosophy, I like listening to, going through all the different ideas that people have and about what's the best way to live, what it means to be human, all the different things. But if it's only just in ideas, it doesn't really change your life. You need it, but you also need to be able to put it in a way that you're invited to participate in that faith that you're sharing. So that they can, they, they see that this is something I really want to be part of as well too. I want to live it out as well. If, if you're living it out, I want to live it out too. That's why it's important that we also are testimonies of what we say as well too. If we say that we're going to love other people, then we have to be able to do it as well too. And obviously we're imperfect, but we try our best. I mean, I've gone to Mass too, sometimes guilty, and just not being present, you know, being present, but not. Yeah. But then sometimes I go and I get so much out of that, you know. Like, so I'd like the, I would like the, when I'm sharing, that they feel that they're coming not just to a place, but a relationship. Yeah. I don't know what the truth is. No, it's very true. Like, they, they Maybe I'm a bit embarrassed to share that relationship. You know what I mean? I'm actually thinking rather than say, yes, I go to church, then you should try to go. If I actually take that little step further, open up myself, yep. and say, so I really feel the love when I'm in there, like I feel like, I'm, like someone wants me, it's hard to explain. If I just go that bit deeper, which we hate talking about over coffee, about you know, <laughs> how I feel, yep. maybe that, you know, I think we have to open ourselves up a little bit, it be vulnerable yep. for them to see us. Like if you want to take someone on the journey, yeah, you know, it's yeah. really accessible, it's got to be yeah. relatable, and you've got to offer something yeah. of yourself first. Because I feel like saying, they will. If I feel like saying, go to church, it's really good. I really, that's not deep, but I don't know if that's enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. Like, you, you've got to, I think, give them that. Yeah, vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. That mm -hmm. vulnerability that comes out with it and everything like that. And then they, they can, as long as they can, I, I believe, as long as they can see your your genuine and that you're someone that, that's what will make it relatable. Yeah. That's what will make it also you say, oh, I can do that as well too. Yeah. But you, it's, you don't always do that. But they've got to feel that they could do that too. Yeah. Which is the whole relating thing. But if it's so theoretical, so then no one thinks oh, yeah. well that's just fine and tight. Yeah. You know, if it doesn't have some sort of tangible yeah. thing that someone can see in their lives now, not just. But some people have different tastes as well too. Yeah. Like the, the theoretical side of things is really important for some people. Mm -hmm. like I, I know myself, I'm a little bit, yeah, no, I, I like intellectual stuff, sometimes, yeah. sometimes more practical, yeah. or I don't know what you say practical, yeah. but, but sometimes I really like seeing like the, the doctors of the church, like Augustine and Aquinas, see what they say about certain things, and it feels theoretical, but then it's not actually, it's actually very practical when you put it into your thing. I don't know if you, you've been yeah. say so far. Yeah, yeah, just on that as well, I think, um, I think one of the reasons I like the theoretical side is that it's, it's undiluted, like it's an ideal, I think when, when it's embodied like in people, then that's when you start to see Paul's like, oh, well, but you're not living it out, but you're not living But if it's just an idea, you say, this is what we all try well, to do. It should be. <laughs> yeah, then it makes sense that we're not all, not everyone's going to be able to live up to it to the same level. So I always like presenting the idea so that it doesn't rest on me, because if it's on me, then we're like, oh, but you're not doing this, but you're not doing that. So it's like, no, it's not about me. It's that there's an objective truth that we're all trying to get to. 
So I, I always like the theoretical one because it sort of separates me from the truth, which uh, I, I like the truth to stand on its own, regardless of whether the people are actually able to live up to that ideal or not. Um, that's what I say. I like them. Personally, I like a mixture as well, too. Like, that's opposite to yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. I like the I guess you can make an audience too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was thinking about this in terms of like, okay, this is what we want to try and do is find a way, well, we, we hope that our method of sharing is inviting them to come to this point of like making it transformative for themselves as well too. So they enter into a way where it, it, it doesn't just stay with words, but it does become part of their life. And this is like, the, the goal of Christian life in general is to become Christ. Well, the, what we call the universal call to holiness for every single person is that you're trying to become a saint. You're trying to become the, the perfect person that you can be. Obviously, perfection is, is in a sense, unattainable because we're all, in, in some way, shape, or form, got a, a fallen nature and through sin and everything else that comes in with it. But we're trying our best to become as close as we can to perfect, and especially because we're made in the image and likeness of God, we're trying, we've been given our role model as Jesus Christ, who is the, the revelation of, of God and man at the same time. So we're trying our best to become Christ in, in as much as we can. And obviously, when we say it's not necessarily appearance, whatever, everyone's a different person, everyone's got different different sex and different uh, way of living and everything like that. So like, there's no way we can all be the same person, the same Christ. But when we live out our true identity, it's becoming as much like Christ as we can as who we are. And as this is actually for our Bourbon Day fraternity, like the, the brothers and sisters that are fully consecrated, but it's, for, it's from our the words from our founder. But I really like it, especially because it talks about this is the goal of every single Christian, actually, to have this, this point. So it's saying, the Bourbon Day fraternity, with the motto of the first disciples of Jesus, so this is our personal uh, way of trying to be Christ, is or ratione et ministerial verbis. Distantis, my Latin's not so good. Who knows Latin? Do you know what that is? Yes. To I think the right to is our prayer, right? Mm -hmm. And ministry, uh, the word, etc. So, yeah. I'm speaking at the moment. Yeah, so it's from Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, no problem. So it's, it's when the first Christian disciples, remember when they, were, the, uh, they had troubles amongst themselves in, in Acts 6, when the some of the widows weren't getting fed enough, and some weren't, and, all that kind of stuff. and then the, the apostles said, look, what we're going to dedicate ourselves is to prayer and ministry of the word. And then we're going to pick other people. St. Stephen was the first one, and the other deacons to look after all the other stuff. So that's it. But it was what you, they understood that the, the apostles or the, the minister, ministry in that way, they were looking after themselves to prayer and ministry of the word. So in other words, trying to pray as much as can and transmit that, that prayer to everyone else as well too. But, so our, our Christian, our Bourbon Day community, that's what we understand as our motto, I think. But in the spirit of the first Christian community, it centers on a specific mission in the Word of God. To pray with the Word, assimilate it until it becomes our own life, transforming ourselves in it, and then teaching others to do the same. So they may pray, live and teach, and pass it on as well too. So it's like a, a chain reaction, I think. But I want, the part I want to point to is that our specific mission is the Word of God is Jesus Himself. So that's not only the Bible. Sometimes we only think, but that's the whole of the Christian faith. It's Jesus Himself is the living Word of God. So what we're trying to do is to pray with Jesus, to pray with all that we know about our Christian faith and the revelation coming from God. Make it our own. So in other words, try and make it where we ourselves live it out, as well, the living parts part, part of it, the transforming ourselves in it. So, but, so it's taking these truths of faith that are given to us, understanding how we can connect to it, living it out, putting it into practice, and then passing it on to other people. That's the goal of, of in fact, we believe it's the goal of every Christian person who's been baptised. That you're going to hear that your faith given to you by your, whoever that comes from, your parents, from your own reading and studies and, and your own thing and the world around us. But all of us have got that same task of like get, getting that faith in some shape or form making it relative to ourselves and other people, but first and foremost, so we can understand it, living it, putting it into practice, and then passing it on. That's the, the very basic steps that are given to every single Christian. So I was thinking that we could sort of focus a little bit upon that 
process uh, if we're going to try and prepare preachings or guidelines or, or sessions for satellite or whatever we're trying to do, all the different things, and see, see how that works in, in, in it, as, as like a basis. So in that sense, like a faith dynamic, we'd like to propose like this dynamic of, of listening, which is that first part where you said where you, you pray with the word of God, assimilating it, putting it into practice, living it out, and then obviously trying to pass it on to announce. If any of you have been to our retreats, many times we give this as the blueprint of prayer. Like when we hand it out to people at the beginning of a, of a retreat. So that if it helps you to actually pray, to, to make it into your life. But it, it's not just for, for praying with the Word of God, it's everything. It's, for, it's, it's the main ways that everyone tries to, to understand their faith. So I was thinking, for example, if you think about anything you do with your faith, how, do you, how does it enter into your life? For example, the Eucharist. When we go there, we hear, we see and hear and everything, and we actually taste of everything as well too, but that, that receiving, we hear, this is the word, uh, this is, uh, I am this body. This is my body, this is my blood. And then when we say, the name of God, it takes away the sins of the world. Like we understand all of that in that moment. We understand that that is Jesus right there in front of us, transformed. We then try to connect to it, understand it, as much as we can in that moment, live it later because we actually <laughs> assimilate it, we take it into ourselves, and then we're meant to become this temple of Christ. We're meant to become Christ ourselves when we've got Jesus himself living within us. And then when we go out from there, we're meant to pass on that same grace that's been given to us to every other person as well too. That dynamic is always the same in that sense. We're given, we're given it, we've got to try and understand it, accept it, and then put it into our own life, into our own practice. If you do the roshan, it's actually the same thing as well too. When we're meditating, we're meditating on all the different mysteries of Christ. You hear it, in a sense, when you first say, okay, the first mystery is an annunciation. You, depends, you can also be meditating on other things as well too, and all the different parts, but in that moment, you're meditating on what does that mystery mean. Ideally, somehow it comes into your own life and you realize, okay, if God had a plan for Mary, hopefully it also means that I've got a plan for my own life as well too, to say yes to as well, the same as Mary did. Then, of course, the living out part is that you actually hopefully agree to say yes and make decisions and different things that does say yes. And the announcing is that you hopefully will pass it on to someone else how to pray the rosary, but also how to live your own life and all the different parts as well too. And that's the same in, in every, like when we receive a sacrament, like my brother Dan, who was sharing just to me the other day, when he was preaching the last marriage he did, he was preaching that, okay, here you've got, you're having the marriage. The wedding is happening in this moment. But when you go home, you've got to live it out. So like, it's not, and all of you who, who have been through many, many different experiences of that kind of stuff, like, uh, it's not just simply the marriage isn't, the wedding isn't the marriage. It's, it's the beginning of it. It's where you receive the grace to live it out that you've later got to assimilate it, make it your own, and make it your, your partner's as well too, and then it's the living out that actually what, what makes the marriage in, in its fullness. And then the announcing is naturally you announce what, what it means to be married to other people around you as well too, when people see what, what happens with marriage as well too. I can tell you, I'll put there all these different things that you could do, like devotions. I was thinking actually, I, I didn't get a chance to go to your Sacred Heart uh, session that you did, do you, do you go to that one, Charles? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, Tafara and Shannon went to that one, then. Got, I, was, I was impressed. I, I didn't get a chance to go to it because I was on retreat, to sort the of summer retreat. But I had a look over the plan of it. And the way that you did it, I found it really, really special, actually, the way that you do it. I know, and talking to the people who went to it, they actually, a lot of them said that they got a lot out of it and they enjoyed it. But I don't know if you want to share roughly how, did, how you did it. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, so we talked a little bit about the, uh, the first Friday devotion, the Sacred Heart. Uh, so we started off by giving a bit of a historical context of what the Sacred Heart is. And then we um, had a, a prayer session, because there's 12 promises associated with the Sacred Heart. So we had a, a prayer uh, time to meditate on each of those 12 history, uh, 12 uh, promises. And then after that we had discussions uh, to talk about like, how the Sacred Heart had played a part in people's lives and what it meant for them. And 
that was new for a lot of people. So it was cool because we did it on um, a couple of Fridays ago. So the Friday that was coming up was the first Friday. And one of the main promises is if you do, if you go to Mass and receive the Eucharist in honor of the Sacred Heart on the first Friday of each month, uh, for nine months in a row, then you receive the 12 promises. But the 12th one is um, whoever receives it uh, nine consecutive months in a row will never die in a state uh, displeasing to God or always receive the sacrament. And there's lots of cool stories um, of uh, people who have done that devotion and uh, when they're on their deathbed, uh, and somehow a priest finds a way to come to them and give them the last uh, rites and things like that. So it was cool, like the week after, um, a lot of people were coming up and saying uh, they went to their first first Friday, so um, the Friday before and stuff. So yeah, it seemed like it was a good session. That's what I really liked about it, because it like the first part, you took the first part, you know, I think, yeah. you, know, you sort of explained what was the devotion, like how did, how did it develop with time and all the way through the history of it and everything like that, and then obviously where Sister Mar Mary Margaret uh, was the one who sort of yeah. put it out as a devotion and everything like that. It also gave a little bit of your own personal part at the end as well too, how you've been doing it and stuff like that. So I really liked it, that was sort of like the, the giving them the chance to listen to it. What is, what is this, this devotion we're even talking about? You're explaining out how the hearts on the outside, what all the different parts that it means. And then the, the second, like I saw the, um, yeah, with all the promises, I saw that Shannon had actually took each part, each promise and sort of like adapted it a little, like blurb or whatever, for what does it mean that you've given the grace to, for the state of life that you're meant to be in? So she sort of said, this means it. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So it's it sort of like the assimilation part of like trying to apply it to each person's life. And then, as you're saying, you invited them all to live it out, to go there and do it. And they actually did. So it's sort of like, you can sort of, um, listening to them as well too, like afterwards they were announcing how much they got out of it and how much, and even whether were, other people would want to do this devotion. So it was like all these steps were there, yeah. and it was really nice to sort of see how how it became sort of successful through through that as well too, like in that way. Yeah, that's good. Mm. So I found it really, yeah, really special. So it's the same with all of our different, different parts, like, like if you recognize, it's not that just simply whenever we try and share our faith by following the formula, but if we understand how, how people make their faith part of their life, then we can sort of adapt our, our sharing with the intention of doing it in, the, in a specific way. So that people do enter into that, that, that dynamic of, of their faith. But I don't, I don't think we need to go through teaching about sex. About, before marriage, that's the same thing, basically. <laughs> you can tell them as much as you want, but it's, it's really when they assimilate it and say, okay, this is something I really want to do. And, understand the reasons for it and like and then put it into practice then they actually understand what it really all means but i just want to say my, my own experience this week actually was on tuesday the gospel is also connected with the gospel today um on tuesday was the part where jesus was in the gospel of matthew jesus was going around looking like healing as many people and he got to this point where he was looking at the people and he had compassion on them, like sheep without a shepherd because they were so lost and he was, he was recognizing, wow, I, I need to do more. I want to go and reach out to them more. And the word that it uses, the Greek word, is splanchnizomai, uh, or something, I don't know how to say it exactly very well, but, <laughs> but it's this, it's, this uh, it's translated into having compassion or having pity, but if you go to the actual real Greek, it's translated by going, my insides are like moved, like as if someone's twisting something within me that I can't leave them alone. Like I have, and it's the same verb that was used for the, um, the, the reading of t today, or today, in the, in the Sunday reading of the, the Good Samaritan, where he would, remember the priest and the Levite walk on past, but it says that when the Good Samaritan saw him, the half-dead guy, he had this, this same word, verb is used, and he had compassion, so he couldn't walk past. He had to stop and turn and go to him in that part. So I remember like, like that was what, what I was preaching a little bit about on the, on the weekend, on Tuesday. And then I was also thinking a little bit about how, what's it really mean for me? Because one thing is to, to have it in theory, to listen to it, but then the other thing is, what's it really mean for me? And then during the week, like there's many times where people ask you for help and stuff like that. But the big one I noticed was like, our youth camp got, got canceled out at uh, the Benedict Retreat Center. We were not able to do it out there because of the flooding. And then part of me, especially when talking to some of the younger ones and the leaders who had been preparing the whole time, wanting to still give it, and then the younger ones who, who had put aside the days to do it, like, I felt that, that experience of like, okay, 
can we do it something else? Can we can we do a camp? And that's what we're hopefully going to do next week. That's, to be honest, it's screwed up the whole <laughs> the whole week of this thing. We've been trying to understand how to how to underdo it, how to change it around, and that kind of stuff has been like giving me a lot of stress and all the parts that go with it. But it was sort of like this understanding that uh, I can't walk past. Like I want to really reach out and help this person in that way. So it was, it was sort of like the the prayer that I had on Tuesday or Thursday, and Tuesday especially, is sort of coming into my life now. And I realize that I've, I want to live it out now. And my, my way of living it out is actually trying to find a way where I take an option where I don't walk on by it, but I try and uh, reach out in my own way. So I was just thinking, like, that's my own personal way of trying to understand that this, this isn't just theory. Like, we've got to put it into practice. And when we do put it into practice, that's when our faith really takes and starts to become alive. And part of it. Okay. Okay, so I thought maybe we could practice a little bit, if you're okay with this. I know it's not, not too theoretical and everything, but we'll practice a little bit about what do each of the steps mean. If we get a chance, hopefully at the end, we'll have a, like the last part to do a bit of a workshop of actually, again, trying to prepare something uh, using these steps. Or, and then the idea is like to, uh, to invite other people to, to follow that as well too. Okay, so with listening, is to put the word of Jesus into practice requires first that we have to listen. So the connection between listening and acting is really big, actually. In Latin, for example, uh, I don't know if you, heard, you know this or you've heard this before, but uh, one of our sister, sister Teresa will talk about this actually just recently. But in the word Latin for obey is obediere. I don't know if my pronunciation is right, but obediere. And it's literally, if you take it apart, the obvious to or towards. And it's taken from ordire, which is to listen. So to obey, actually, if you take it down to its root, is to listen. To be able to listen properly, or to give ear to it, or to understand it. And it's interesting. So in that sense, like if we want to try and put any of our faith into practice and make it part of our life, first, the first and most important step is to listen. Then you can know what to listen to, what to, what to obey, what to, to, to carry out. I was thinking maybe just to do a, a very short exercise of one minute. We stop, don't do anything at all, just simply listen to what you can hear. Okay, so starting from now, and at the end we'll say what we, we heard. What were some of the things you heard when you listened? Just now? Yes, just now. Maybe that's the. Yes, there's a one creak from over that side. Yeah, big creak, yeah. And there was a sound like, even in the distance, a car possibly. Yeah. Okay. And then the sound of your own head. Yeah. <laughs> it was the sound of silence. There you go. Child, do you hear anything else? Or? Like the truly. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. Very good. I 
it's the same. Like I can. We can do a um, have a look at the beatitudes. They're, they're very um, they're sort of you've probably heard them all before at some stage, maybe. Yes, yes. Before you start, 
then you'd have to come back with a battery back to the CD or the default. That is, if I can express my good opinion, yep. that is, I believe that if you want to transmit whatever I think, whether in politics, whether in whatever philosophy or sociology or whatever, science, uh, you must be absolutely convinced of it. True. Very good. If you are not totally convinced about it, you won't be able to transmit anything. That is, conviction is the only factor to help people be impressed about what goes. This is nothing. I agree very much. Yeah. And that's, I think, probably, I'm only, I don't want to speak for you, but I think that's the importance of, like, if you yourself go through this process, of understanding, trying to understand, learn as much as you can, listen to what the, the truth you're going to try and share, make it part of your life, integrate it completely in there, then you've got that conviction to share it to other people. Otherwise, Otherwise yeah, they'll pick it up. And this is something you're not able to believe. You have an ordinary conversation when we discuss about whatever topic. Yep. And we discuss it, for example, with my family and so on. Yep. And that is I, I witness that people who are really, really convinced about it, they, they are able to impose that. I, yes. I see. But in face is the same, you will be convinced about that. Yep. I believe that. Uh, otherwise, <coughs> if you show that you are not quite sure, by, by your way of, even the, the tone of the tone of your voice, you are not quite convinced about it. I think that's at the very bottom of it all, isn't it? I agree. And maybe that leads us to knowing about the work we Very good, <coughs> yeah. Like the more you get, I agree. Yes. Conviction comes from, 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 from that point of knowing it so well that you actually yes. truly believe it. That's why I told you that already that I, love, I am very interested in the gospel part of mm -hmm. Because in order to be able to talk about Jesus, I must know Jesus. And in order to know Jesus, I was read the gospel. And in fact, every single word and, and uh, deed of Jesus. That's why I have been convinced. Yeah. Yes. Very good. I agree. I agree. And, uh, I was not saying, the cool thing about Jesus, I was thinking about it, he's, he's, he's both an ideal and a person at the same time. So I think it helps bridge that gap. I also find Mother Mary very similar, actually, in a sense, like, we know that she was conceived without sin, so in some sense, like, we think that she was, like, <laughs> didn't really sin all the way through either as well, too, but, <laughs> but she was completely fully human as well, too, so all the, when we see, like, uh, her way of, like, saying yes to God, and even with the questions and doubts that she had and stuff like that, it's relatable because we can actually think, but then also it's the ideal, like, you know, one to follow. Some of the other saints, I find really good as well too in that sense that because maybe because the relatable part is actually more relatable because they sin <laughs> and they get things wrong and stuff like that but they, they're not the perfect ideal actually but, but they're still trying to follow you know. yeah. no you're right yeah. Yeah. okay so yeah we're going to okay so this this one what we thought we could do is um, the Beatitudes do you want to use I know Tafara's been going through Matthew. You want to use Matthew? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Matthew's Yeah? Because yeah? <laughs> I, I don't know whether you're already sick of going through Matthew all the time. But we could use either Matthew or Luke, but uh, okay, let's all go to Matthew. It's the easiest one. Luke's ones have got all the woe as well, too. So you've got the blessings, but then also got the ones who don't aren't so blessed. And so Matthew 5. The idea, the idea is we'll spend just like a couple of minutes. Have a look at it, read it all carefully, as much as you can, and then listen to these words of Jesus himself. This is what he's saying, where he starts the Sermon on the Mount. And then try and figure out which one speaks to you the most, and why. And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll do a little bit of why, as well, in a sec. But more or less, there's lots of different blessings are, so have a quick look at it. And also look at the what happens for those blessings as well, too, not just the, <laughs> the blessed of the poor, but also that they will receive the,
quite keep coming through because we're still just on the list of the party. So, <laughs> so was, maybe we can go around each one and you can say, say what which one which one really spoke to you the most. A little more quiet. Righteousness to be just. I don't know if I'm on the right track with that, but the one that I thought was number six so blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that they will be filled. I always find that, yeah. I always look at the world. Yeah, I kind of always look at the justice in the world and the righteousness and how decisions are made, and I often think, I always look at the two sides and go, yeah, I always feel like, but that's not right. That's not right that they're doing, you know. I, I feel that. Thank you. 